uh, welcome back to this next video and uh, in this video we are going to talk about the uh, clostridium perfringens now clostridium perfringens that is uh, one of the most common causes of food poisoning alongside the norovirus salmonella the campylobacter and staphylococcus aureus uh, however, uh, sometimes the uh, ingestion of the Clostridium perfringens, uh, they can cause no harm. Uh, if you talk about the uh, infection that is caused due to uh, Clostridium perfringens, that actually show the evidence of tissue necrosis, the bacteremia in the gas gangrene. And in this particular video, uh, we will be focusing on this uh, gas gangrene, how this gas gangrene that is actually caused by the Clostridium perfringens. Now the uh, specific name perfringens that is derived from the Latin uh, per meaning through and the frangio mean burst uh, which actually refers to the disruption of tissue that you see in the uh, gas gangrenes that occur uh, during the infection of the clostridium perfringens. Now the uh, toxin that is involved in the gas gangrene that is the alpha toxin that we'll be focusing on in detail. Uh, so this alpha toxin what it do is that it insert itself into the plasma membrane of the cell thereby producing gaps in the membrane and when there are gaps in the membrane that actually disrupt the normal cellular function. Now the clostridium perfringens that can also participate in the uh, polymicrobial anaerobic infections. Now the uh, action of the Clostridium perfringens on dead bodies uh, is known to mortuary workers as the uh, tissue gas. Uh, what they usually see is in the dead body that there is production of the gas tissue if they are infected by the Clostridium perfringens. Now this uh, infection actually uh, causes extremely accelerated decomposition because it is, as you will see in a while that the Clostridium perfringens that actually cause the uh, death of the tissue and if there is death of the tissue that means there will be an accelerated uh, decomposition during the Clostridium perfringens and this uh, accelerated decomposition that cannot be uh, stopped by the normal embalming measures in which you are using the formaldehyde. Now these bacteria is they are resistant to the uh, presence of the formaldehyde in normal concentration so they actually leads to the accelerated decomposition of the dead bodies. Uh, if you talk about the uh, biochemical properties or the uh, laboratory identification of Clostridium perfringens. So the uh, Clostridium perfringens, they are rod shaped gram positive bacteria as you can see over here. Uh, they are rod shaped and if they are uh, colored purple in the gram staining that means they are gram positive. Now the Clostridium perfringens, they have got a capsule uh, outside their uh, cells. Uh, and if this capsule is present, this is very important in the uh, adhesion of the Clostridium perfringens to the uh, host cells and they also aid in the immune evasion by preventing ingestion by the uh, phagocytes. Uh, the Clostridium perfringens, they are the uh, endospore forming bacteria and these endospores, they are actually dormant, tough and non-reproductive structures. And this endospore formation that is usually trigger, triggered by uh, unfavorable conditions uh, like if there is a leak of the nutrients and that is a very common phenomena occurring in the gram positive bacteria. Now if you uh, talk about the uh, spores or these endospores of the Clostridium perfringens, they are actually over in shape as you can see in this particular figure and they are subterminal. They are not present at the terminal, they are present at subterminal position. The uh, Clostridium perfringens, they are anaerobic, uh, that means they live and grow in uh, low oxygen conditions uh, and in some time they usually prefer the complete anaerobic conditions, uh, but they actually tolerate the traces of oxygen due to the enzyme superoxide dismutase and the function of the superoxide dismutase is to help break down potentially harmful oxygen to molecules, uh, oxygen molecules in the cell. If these anaerobic bacteria, if they are exposed to traces of the oxygen because of the presence of the superoxide dismutase, those traces of oxygen can be broken down by the help of the uh, superoxide dismutase. Now this uh, superoxide dismutase that is an important antioxidant defense mechanism in the, the all anaerobic cells that are exposed to uh, oxygen. The uh, Clostridium perfringens they are catalase negative what I mean by that is that they are the non-producers of the catalase enzyme 
and if you go for the catalyst test and if an organism is catalyst positive they actually produce these uh, bubble like structure when they are exposed to the hydrogen peroxide but if the organism is a uh, catalyst negative like in the case of the clostridium perfringens so if they are exposed to the uh, hydrogen peroxide you will not be seeing any kind of this uh, bubble structure over here the clostridium perfringens they are also oxidase negative and that means that they do not produce a special enzyme which is known as the cytochrome c oxidase and if you can see over here uh, these uh, papers they are actually uh, embedded with a particular chemical which is known as the tetramethyl uh, p-phenyl uh, uh, p-phenyl uh, diamine or they are the dimethyl p-phenyl uh, p-phenylene diamine so if the organism is uh, oxidase positive what it do is that the cytochrome c oxidase is going to act on this particular substrate and that is going to give you a color product is the uh, clostridium perfringens they are oxidase negative that means they will not be having this uh, cytochrome c oxidase so they will not be able to act on this particular substrate and if they cannot act on this substrate they are not going to give you any uh, colored product over here so the uh, clostridium perfringens they are oxidase negative so you will be seeing a result like this the uh, clostridium perfringens and uh, they are non-motile in nature and if you compare the uh, motile and the non-motile bacteria with each other so in the tube of the uh, motility nitrate medium about the clostridium perfringens it actually show growth along the stab line is non-motile organism they do they produce growth only in and along the stab and if you can see over here they are only showing you growth uh, the in the stab line or along the stab line that means that clostridium perfringens that is non motile uh, what the motile organism do that usually produce uh, diffuse growth out of the medium and that is actually uh, away from the uh, stab lines the clostridium perfringens that usually produce a double zone of beta hemolysis or you can say they actually produce a double zone of hemolysis now there are actually uh, three types of the hemolysis one is known as the alpha hemolysis also known as the partial hemolysis the other one is known as the beta hemolysis which actually refers to the complete hemolysis and there is gamma hemolysis which actually refers to no hemolysis when you talk about the clostridium perfringens that actually uh, give you uh, a double zone of hemolysis now the um, inner zone that actually show the uh, complete hemolysis as you can see over here if these are the organisms uh, you have uh, inoculated them on the blood agar so on the interior they actually give you the uh, complete hemolysis and that is very clear by these uh, yellow color that you can see over here and uh, the outer zone that may display partial or the alpha hemolysis as you can see over here this greenish structure that you can see uh, that actually refers to the uh, partial hemolysis so in case of the uh, clostridium perfringens uh, on the interior you are actually seeing the uh, beta hemolysis or the complete hemolysis while outer zone that may display the uh, partial hemolysis now the disease that is caused by the uh, clostridium perfringens uh, that is known as the gaze gangrene now the uh, clostridium perfringens uh, causing this gaze gangrene is also known as the uh, clostridial myonecrosis or it is simply also known as the uh, myonecrosis so the gaze gangrene the clostridial myonecrosis or the myonecrosis that actually refers to one in the same thing now what happens uh, during the gaze gangrene is that there is myonecrosis which actually refers to the uh, muscle tissue death there is gas production during the gaze gangrene and there can also be a uh, sepsis now this sepsis is actually a life-threatening condition that arises when the body responds to the infection uh, causes injury to its own tissue and organs so in case of the gas gangrene you can see this uh, myonecrosis in gas production but you can also see this the condition of the sepsis now the clostridium perfringens that causes this uh, myonecrosis by the production of uh, special exotoxins and the important exotoxin we will discuss that in a while now most gangrene infection that occur in situation where open wounds from an injury or surgery they are exposed to the clostridium perfringens uh, but however the gas gangrene that can occur anywhere on the body but it mostly affect the arms or the legs of the patient 
this is actually an image where you can actually see the uh, death of this tissue and the production of the gas or the edema uh, in the uh, leg of a particular patient now, if you talk about the uh, virulence factor of the uh, Clostridium perfringens, uh, the most important virulence factor that is known is the uh, alpha toxin. Now, this alpha toxin that is uh, produced by the uh, special strain of the Clostridium perfringens, which is known as the strain A. And this uh, alpha toxin is actually zinc metallophospholipase. Uh, and the uh, alpha toxin they actually require zinc as well as calcium for their activation and hence for their activity so they are uh, metallic that means they require zinc therefore you can actually see this term metallo over here they are actually responsible for the uh, degradation of certain uh, phospholipids and therefore it is known as the phospholipase so the activity of the alpha toxin that depends both on the uh, presence of the zinc as well as the calcium now what happens is that the C-terminal domain of the alpha toxin uh, that enters into the phospholipid bilayer and the N-terminal domain which is, which is actually containing the active site of the alpha toxin uh, that actually have phospholipase C as well as the uh, sphingomyelinase activity. What I mean by the uh, phospholipase C and the sphingomyelinase activity is that the uh, alpha toxin has the ability to hydrolyze the phosphatidyl choline which is present in the cell membrane and it also has the ability of the, the of hydrolyzing the uh, sphingomyelase uh, sphingomyelin which is actually degraded by the sphingomyelinase. Now the phosphatidyl codeine and the sphingomyelin, they are the two very important component of a eukaryotic cell membrane. Now the breakdown of the uh, sphingomyelin, uh, this one, this is very uh, detrimental to the body because this uh, sphingomyelin that is very abundant in the myelin sheet that surround the uh, axons of the uh, neurons. Uh, now these axons uh, they are actually surrounded by the spingomyelin and without the spingomyelin the neuron axon will not be covered and therefore will not be electrically insulated now the speed of the uh, uh, the speed of the message transfer of the neuron that actually depends on this electrical insulation and this electrical insulation is actually provided by the spingomyelin so if the alpha toxin is going to degrade this uh, spingomyelin that means that the axon they will not be electrically insulated and if they are not uh, electrically insulated they are going to negatively affect the uh, message transfer by the neuron now the myelin sheet is important in the transport of the action potential action potential simply mean the transfer of message from one area of the neuron to another area of the neuron or from one neuron to the other neuron uh, so the myelin sheet that is important in the transport of the action potential down the axon and delivering message from brain to the other parts of the body now, if the uh, alpha toxin that is going for the uh, degradation of the spingomyelin and hence affecting the function of the uh, neuron, therefore the alpha toxin can hinder the immune system response by damaging the nerve cell. And if the messages about the whereabout of the attacking pathogen cannot be transmitted uh, from by the uh, nervous system from one part to another part, the immune system will not know how to respond and attack. Now this alpha toxin that also cleaves the host cell phospholipid bilayer, uh, the phosphatidyl choline, the important uh, component of the cell membrane. So the alpha toxin is also cleaving the phospholipid bilayer and interrupting the membrane function, which actually promotes the cell lysis and ultimately death. So the two important um, negative effect of the alpha toxin on the body is that they are going to uh, hydrolyze the sphingomyelin, thereby affecting the function of the nervous system, but they can also degrade the phospholipid bilayer especially the uh, phosphatidyl codeine in the cell membrane and if that is disrupted that actually disrupt the phospholipid bilayer which ultimately uh, leads to the cell lysis and ultimately uh, death now this toxin uh, it also is responsible for relocation of the platelet fibrinogenin receptor from the inside of the platelets to its membrane 
So when you talk about the uh, platelet, there is a specific receptor which is known as the uh, platelet uh, fibrinogen receptor, which is actually present inside the platelets. But this particular uh, toxin, it is actually responsible for relocation of the platelet uh, fibrinogen receptor from the inside of the platelet to its membrane. Now, this ability of the alpha toxin for the relocation of this particular receptor is because of the production of the diacylglycerol. When the alpha toxin it affects the when it targets the uh, phosphatidyl choline by its phospholipase activity, one of the product is known as the diacylglycerol, and this diacylglycerol is actually responsible for relocation of platelet fibrinogen receptor from inside of the platelet to its membrane. Now, what this relocation do is that it triggers the formation of more platelets and platelet aggregates and these uh, more platelets and the platelet aggregate it actually contributes to an elevated vascular permeability and when there is increased vascular permeability that can actually lead to edema which is actually the buildup of fluids in the tissue that as you can see in this particular diagram that there will be a uh, buildup of the uh, fluid which is actually known as the edema so this edema is actually because of the uh, platelets aggregate and which actually leads to the uh, uh, elevated vascular permeability. Now, if I summarize the whole story of the uh, alpha toxin, what it do is first it is going to uh, attach to the uh, binding site on the exterior of the membrane. Then the uh, C domain, it is going to insert itself into the host membrane. Then the N domain is going to hydrolyze the phosphatidylcholine, thereby producing the diacylglycerol, which will lead to edema and the degradation of the spingomyelin in the uh, axons of the neuron, thereby affecting the uh, immune system. Now this diagram is actually showing you uh, about the N and the C terminal of the uh, alpha toxin. If you talk about this uh, N domain, it actually starts from the amino acid number 1 to amino acid number 250. And this is the active domain. By that I mean that the active site of the uh, alpha toxin that is present in the N terminal domain. Now, if you talk about this C domain, it actually is from 251 to 370 amino acids, and these residues. And if you can see over here that this C domain is actually the domain that, that is binding to the uh, cell membrane of the cell. As you can see over here inside of the uh, cell, there will be, uh, there is calcium and this calcium is actually going to bind to the uh, C domain and it binds over here that is actually responsible for the uh, activation of the uh, N domain over here. Now inside the cell membrane, as you can see over here, you have got the uh, phosphatidylcholine and when this phosphatidylcholine, it is broken down, you can see over here one of the product that is known as the uh, diacylglycerol, which is responsible for the uh, uh, platelet aggregation and hence for edema. Another important thing is that when the uh, N-terminal domain that is going for the cleavage of the phosphatidylcholine, uh, on one side it is producing the diacylglycerol, but on the other side it is also uh, disrupting the uh, membrane of the cell, thereby increasing using the uh, vascular permeability and hence the edema. So if you like the video, please subscribe to my channel, hit the like button and share it with your friends. And in the next video, we'll be talking about uh, some other uh, other wilderness factors of the Clostridium perfringens. We'll be talking about its diagnosis, the symptoms and the, uh, uh, and the treatment.